Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for having me on the forum. It's always a delight to connect with the youth. As you all are aware, over the last uh, nearly two months, we are every single day we talk of uh, Kargil war because we commemorate what great actions have been taken by the soldiers. They were all young people like you. Soldiers, officers, especially the young officers, 20 something, and how they led their soldiers, their teams with great elan. And day after day, we saw so many of them laying down their lives for the country. And it, the best part is it just did not deter the next one from going in. So why am I saying this to you? Whether it is Kargil or Kashmir, we always find that is the youth who always take the lead. And not only in the military, not only in the army. You look at your field. In every walk of life today, it is the younger people who are taking the lead. I mean, even the politicians, we are having younger leaders now. My heart fills with joy when I see such eager young faces as yours. It fills with a lot of confidence that you are going to drive the growth story of India. You are going to take India forward. You are going to take the world forward. Let me just, um, now that I have such a lot of leaders of tomorrow, leaders of every walk of life sitting here, let me talk of, let me talk of a very important topic that has filled the national discourse today. Not only today, over the last two months or more. And then I'll get back to this topic of youth. The India-China face-off that we are seeing in Ladakh. I think uh, a small explainer would be in order because I see some very young students here. So let me put, to put everyone on the same page. Let me explain that India has a 15,000 kilometers of land borders with six other countries. And I'm not counting the maritime borders with three others. But out of that, we have a unique position that our international borders with Pakistan, as well as with China, have some portions that are unresolved. They have not ratified as international borders. On the Pak side, Pakistan side, we have a line of control, which is a roughly 780 kilometers long. Line of control has been ratified, signed, accepted by both sides to be resolved later. I will not uh, dwell further on that. On India-China border, we have 3,500 kilometers, three and a half thousand kilometers approximately of a line of actual control. Now it is after the 1962 war that we have both the armies have held on to the land that that was in their control and as the name implies it is a line of actual control and this line of actual control also has certain areas where we have a differing perception of the line on ground 23 such areas have been identified by both sides We've had several rounds of talks between India and China. And in these 23 uh, areas of differing perceptions, ADPs as they are called, both sides follow a certain agreed to protocol. Some, certain CBMs, confidence building measures have been laid out. For instance, in both, in all these 23 sides, both armies are allowed to patrol up to their perception of the line. So obviously, there is a certain area in which patrols would overlap. 
So at times when patrols come to come face to face, we disengage by uh, agreed to protocols that have been uh, that have been laid down. But sometimes it, off late, it has been leading to some pushing and shoving. And you would have seen those clips coming on every summer in the last three or four years. Some pushing and shoving, some fisticuffs. But it is to the credit of both the countries that we haven't fired a shot over five decades now at this line of actual control. So what has happened now? This year, in the area of Ladakh, now in Ladakh, it's 850 kilometers approximately of border between the two countries, of which a little under 500 is the line of actual control. In Ladakh this time, there has been this kind of uh, face-off, a standoff in three different areas. We've heard of Pingar area, the Pegongso Lake, the Hot Springs, and Galwan. Pegongso Lake is a very unique lake. It's, it's actually a sea. It is 135 kilometers long. It's, it, you really can't call it a lake. Uh, one third of it, the lake, Pegongso Lake, is on, in the Indian side, and two thirds is with China. So obviously we have a border a LAC over there. And it is that area when you hear of the words finger four, fingers five, finger eight. So fingers are the spurs of the mountains that are coming down into the bank of the to the bank of the lake. It is there between finger four and finger eight that that area of differing perception lies. It is there that our troops have had these face-offs uh, earlier years also. Similarly, there is another place at Hot Springs, further up to the north. And then beyond that, further to the north, short of Depsang Plains, there is a place called Galwan. Now, you've all heard of Galwan. Interestingly, Galwan is not one of the 23 agreed to areas, the areas of differing perceptions. So why, why have the Chinese side or the Chinese army started raising an objection about Galwan this time. As you would have gleaned from the news, if you watched any of the TV debates, Galwan River is flowing roughly, approximately from east to west. And it enters, where it enters India, after that it flows into Shiok River. Where it flows, uh, where it uh, flows into Shiok River, around that place, we have a road that Shiok is roughly north-south and a road, an important road that goes up northwards towards a base, uh, air, air base called DBO, Dolat Beg Oldi. It's a strategic air base for India because it's the highest air base from which can help our logistics and build up in the military apart from serving the sparse population that lives in that area. So Pakistan, I beg your pardon. So China has started objecting to the road. Why do they object to the road? Over the years, China has constructed a very good network of roads on the borders on its side. But India, for different reasons, I will not expand the discussion now. For different reasons, we did not construct our roads earlier. Somewhere in 2003, we started this thought very actively. And the road construction work was started to improve our mobilization, that is mobilization of the military on the borders. As our road is worried that the mobilization differential will narrow. That means we will also be able to mobilize faster on the borders. Therefore, their objection. Therefore, this, uh, this vicious thing that we've seen at Galwan this time, because while shots have not been fired, it is also for the first time that there have been fatal casualties on both sides, Indian as well as Chinese. 
Chinese side is not likely to officially accept it. They have an issue with loss of face, etc. Be that as it may, we have given full honors to those fallen comrades who gave up their lives to defend the borders, to safeguard the territorial integrity of the country. Right. Having said that, what is happening now? What is happening now is that several level of talks have taken place. And I must also tell you that why we, both countries have been able to manage without firing a shot for so many years, because we have a very good mechanism of talks. We have military level talks. We have diplomatic talks. In the military, we have different levels of talks. A colonel level talk, that is a battalion commander, a brigade commander, a brigadier level, major general. And this is this summer, for the first time, we've had the left general level talks where our co-commander in Ladakh has gone to, uh, has taken part in these talks. So what is happening now? We have the pro protocol, I beg your pardon, the talks that have taken place between both sides have agreed that both sides will disengage and go back. Now, disengagement is a very slow process. It becomes worse because we've already had fatalities, passions are aroused, and tempers are frayed. Temperatures may be cool over there, very cold, but the tempers are not. So, what happens in disengagement? A painstakingly all steps are laid down. You, you must have heard in the news a couple of days ago, the left and general level talks, it took 14 hours. Previously, the left and general level talks lasted for 11 and a half hours. So every step is decided and written. For instance, if it is decided that this side will remove this tent from here. Thereafter, the other side will remove that structure from there, from another place. So this is all laid down. When they report that we have removed the structure, they have to then, they have three days to verify. How do you verify? For instance, you have UAVs taking pictures. The other side also shares pictures that they have removed them. Once we are convinced, report to the headquarters. Thereafter, a pet verification patrol is sent. And the patrol would verify that, yes, on ground, the thing has been removed. Then you come back and then you start doing your part of the bargain. What was the next step? And so on, it continues to go on. Don't forget, everyone is talking through interpreters. So if there is a discordant note, it takes, a, it takes so much longer. On the 15th of June, that bloody night in Galwan, that was also a verification patrol. When things turned ugly, a disagreement sparked something else. And then we've had casualties on both sides. Thereafter, everything was put on hold. Passions were aroused and tempers were frayed. So, that can happen. That can happen any moment. So it will require a lot of adroit handling on the part of leaders. It will require maturity on the part of soldiers and all those involved to disengage. So that is why it's going to take a very long haul, certainly this entire summer, if not more. Now, before I come to the Prime Minister's visit in the end, what are the options for us for both China and India at this moment. As far as we are concerned, if we know and we said it that Galwan was not even one of those 23 areas, Galwan by their own claim line of 1960-61 is a part of India, there is no reason why they should be looking at Galwan. And I've already told you the reason why they're looking at that road. Okay. So what are the other options? It requires a whole of nation approach. Military is prepared. Military is prepared to defend itself. Military is prepared to evict a portion militarily if need be. But is the nation ready? Are we, are we ready to have enlarge it into a war? We need all of a nation approach. We also perhaps need the diplomatic element of power to kick in. We also have to have the financial aspects of the, that as an instrument of a national policy to kick in. And 
we also perhaps this is the time to make groupings with other nations which think similarly which have similar issues with china and so that diplomatic and international pressure can be brought to bear on china and this is not the only issue because we all we are seeing china has there are some issues that they are having in south china sea they are having issues in hong kong they are having issues in xinjiang so they have opened, and they are they are going through a trade war with the us they are also and this when the whole world including china in a very big way is is battling a corona crisis at home and abroad so with all this these are our options what india has done in the last few days we have banned all the chinese apps that's a very strong diplomatic as well as financial message we have announced that we will restrict their participation in in our communication sector a couple of companies have been named india has announced that they will not participate in any road construction infrastructure works in which chinese firms do participate with enthusiasm so all in all these are the steps india has taken some more steps are being considered so what what did prime minister's visit do yesterday the prime minister's visit was first of all a morale booster for the indian army for the indian armed forces and also for the whole nation when the leaders go and stand with the soldiers on front line it raises their morale sky high everybody is willing to do whatever it takes to defend the country the prime minister when he interacts with soldiers with officers uh in in the field he gets an unfiltered access an unfiltered uh, uh view and insight into what has happened there i think that is very important he also sends a strong message his visit sent a very strong message to the country because a lot of people have been within the country also there is a there's a discourse that this this should have been done or that should have been done so he silenced the critics apart from raising the morale of the forces and he sent a very strong message to the world that this is what we are prepared to do and most important a strong message to the other side that we want to give peace a chance we want to continue talking we want to continue disengaging but if a push if the push comes to shove we are prepared to do anything he said it in so many words we are prepared to do anything to do what is in our national interest to safeguard the territorial integrity of our borders so dear friends this is what has happened in china uh, indo china face off in uh, ladakh and i would like to leave you with one thought over the last two months or more i have been watching social media go berserk i have been on several tv debates myself and we see views and counter views so to you all you young people i'd like to leave with a thought you all need to be discerning be discerning what what does that mean you will get a, a plethora of views opinions attitudes you will get an overload of information you are in an age you all you type uh, one thing that you want to know one word on google and it gives you millions of sites you are in an age of information overload so you have to be discerning google can give you quick answers but if you are discerning you have you will be able to make out what between what is right or what is wrong well that may be a point of view but you should be able to make out what is fake news what is incongruous so you, your generation will have to develop the ability to do that as you grow up if you are conscious of this you will be able to do it and i am very fond of uh, ending a talk with the youth today i am not able to see all of you in your face 
when I, when I go to colleges and universities and give talks, I'm very fond of giving a talk and ending with this. And let me end with that, despite the fact that I cannot see you face to face, digitally so. I have had many students, many young people walk up to me and say, sir, I want to join the army and I want to do this and I want to serve the country. To all of those who want to say that or who might feel like that at a later moment, you're welcome. You're welcome to join the army or the armed forces. We'll be happy to have enthusiastic young men and women like you. But I also say you don't have to join the army to serve the country. Each one of you is a leader. Each one of you is needed. Every walk of life is required. We need our software engineers, we need our civil engineers, we need those who will construct dams, we need those who will construct the roads, those who will run the entertainment industry. And what have you, everything contributes to the growth story of India, and that is you. So welcome, you are welcome to join the army, but you don't have to join the army. If you don't join the army, you, but remember, be a good citizen. That will be your best contribution. Be a good citizen. Be a citizen worth dying for. And that will be your biggest tribute to a soldier. Be a citizen that he wishes to sacrifice his life for. Thank you. And now I will uh, take, take on some questions. I believe the questions are already here. Do we have the questions? Uh, the first question is the other names. Okay. okay. What was your reaction when you were called to duty after? What was your okay? I, I will read question. Sir, what was your reaction um, when you were called for duty after Uri attack? And how did you strategize the surgical strikes? How close was it to the movie? Can I not answer the last part? How close it was to the movie? <laughs> Is, isn't that answer enough? Okay. Let me get to the serious stuff. What was your reaction? when I was called to duty. No, sir. There was no reaction. I was woken up. 18th September was a Sunday. The darkest Sunday of my life. I was woken up by a phone call. I think it was, must have been around five or a little earlier. To tell me that there has been an attack, a terrorist, a suicide attack on the Uri garrison. And after some time, the next one said, we've lost so many soldiers. Then came the next news, we've lost so many more, the firing is on. So it was not that I'm reporting for a duty. I don't blame you to, uh, if you could not understand. So understand the context. I get the news that this has happened. And then slowly, the death toll keeps going up. My heart keeps sinking. These are my boys, my soldiers. I lost 18 soldiers on my watch. So many of them were younger than my younger son. They were my boys. And I went to Uri. I took a chopper, went to Uri, saw the fires raging. That day, now your question about strategizing for the surgical strike. That very day, the defense minister landed up. And I remember the defense secretary, when he rang me up, he says, defense, secretary, uh, defense minister will arrive in the afternoon by so and so time. And I said, why today? You can imagine I was going through the operations in Udi. I'm going through, they're deciding about how the cremation or the uh, honor guard ceremony will take place uh, next day. We have to inform the families, the, the governor and the chief minister and everyone is calling me. Delhi is calling me. There are so many things going on. And I can't have a defense minister coming on me. The chief, army chief was already in the air. He was already en route. But some good did come out of it. When the defense minister came, he wanted to go to Uri. Then we could not go take him to Uri because of obvious security reasons. And we briefed him. And this pain that we had, this pain of the death of the soldiers, my soldiers wanted revenge. The nation was anguished against this terrorism that was sent across from Pakistan. We decided to turn this pain into an opportunity. We got clearance for doing that strike 10 days later, which is now 
known as surgical strikes. We haven't given this name. Army has not given this name. I certainly didn't. But then that's the name that is stuck. Okay, next question. Is having a war with China at present a better option for India? No, sir. War is never a good option. If you all are surprised to hear a general speak like this, remember, we want to make our army strong. We want to make our nation strong, not to wage war. We want to make our army strong to make sure that there is no war. If you are a strong nation with a strong army, no one will dare to look at you with adversarial eyes. War, sir, is not an option. We should not have a war. I mean, war, if we are pushed to it, we are prepared for it. You all are too young. You have not seen a war. The last war was in 1971. Kargil was not a war. When I say it was not a war, it was happening there in JNK. I was also on the line of control then. But <clears throat> the whole country was not at war. During war, all your freedoms get curbed. National emergency is declared. Everything becomes so much more expensive. All the aircrafts and railway trains will be commanded by the army. You will not have movement of freedom. You will have to start paying extra cess, extra tax on everything. It will set the country back. It will set the country back by 10 to, to 20 years. War is not a pleasant thing to happen. A short war will set you back. I have seen war. We've seen it as kids also. My father was in the Air Force. We've seen those blackouts. We've seen how air raids go right up to Agra. You know, so there can be collateral damage anywhere. I think war is not what we want. We want to give peace a chance. And let's hope we are able to do that by the whole of nation approach that I told you with combining all other instruments, all other elements of power that a nation can muster. Next question. Let me read this. Sir, do you think China's aggression towards Galwan is a plan of aggression towards Tibet, Hong Kong? Now, whoever's asked this question, um, I wish I had the names, uh, uh, is, um, you know, you need to really uh, brush up your Geography, Hong Kong is not this side. So uh, towards Galwan is aggression towards Tibet. No, Tibet is today under China's control. So we'll leave it at that. Yes, but China's aggression toward Galwan is because of this important road that goes to DSDBO. To that extent, if you meant that, you're right. Also, this from DSD, I beg your pardon, from DBO, DBO, Dolat Beg Oldi, the Karakoram Pass is just 12 kilometers up north. That is the importance of DBO. The Uri surgical strike was never called a success from the Pakistani side. They have uh, always said that Indian soldiers just just shoot at empty, uh, sh shot at empty spaces. Is it true? Um, actually, I would not. Uh, somewhere I was asked this question in an open forum. Uh, there was press and media present, and someone who asked me this question. My reply was. I will not even dignify that with an answer. But here, let me just explain to you. What can the Pakistan army say? They've lost, they haven't lost soldiers, but right under their noses, between their posts, we went inside a few kilometers, we knocked off terrorists. They've had a couple of soldiers as casualties. That only shows the nexus. But when you lose so many soldiers, the count is not so important. Whether it was 38 or 68 doesn't matter. We went in, we did it. How, what do you expect them to say? And they did not come to me. Or they could not even react. We, they did not cause a single casualty. So, how can that nation accept it? The Pakistan army is a very strong element in Pakistan polity and their dispensation. So it's very obvious they would say that nothing happened. Unfortunately, there are voices in our country also which support them. So they get uh, support from that. Uh, boycott, sir, boy, boycotting China is going, to, going on, but uh, will this stop China from attacking? Why, uh, why always digital boycott takes place before anything else in case of wars like Indo-China? Indo very good question. Whether or not it will stop China, 
you please understand uh, okay let me first tackle that part of question which is very important very very nice you said, because i don't want to forget that uh, why digital boycott takes place before anything else because today it's an information age it's an era of info warfare digital that is the that is the space where all the debates are taking place where are public spaces today where is the engagement it's all in digital space you have tiktok you have webu i don't even know the names every other platform you stop that the public discourse stops i have learned only in the last two months that china does not have twitter you see so my my point is in digital makes a lot of difference and the other difference that it makes is that we are so dependent on it let me say it openly the united states has supported them india that we've done this but they are unable to ban all the apps in their own country we've taken this courageous step it's a big step i was reading somewhere uh, i i could be wrong but uh, i was reading that the loss to them is going to be 6 billion dollars or something it's not about the loss it's about setting a trend today if one country stands up and says we are not going to do this we have banned it tomorrow others might follow suit a country like china cannot afford that so that's that's there's that's where the risk lies for them will it stop china boycotting it's not the question of whether this will stop china on the other hand we've said we won't allow you to come into communicate a couple of their companies were named they will not be allowed to participate in certain tenders or in certain bids for our telecommunication ventures 5g there one of the big companies is on the threshold of uh, opting for it so if we rethink our actions this will also set a trend like i said it sends a trend in other countries and then it becomes so much more difficult for china to reel in more than the business that they lose they lose face if someone has started to question them someone is starting to question no one questioned them earlier you remember a couple of years ago india did not support their does not still support their belt and road initiative the brief forum summit in china our prime minister refused to go and we did that again the next year we are the only country that has stood up and said we not only we don't support it we oppose your uh, brief forum uh, the brief initiative because cpec is a part of it and cpec that is china pakistan economic corridor runs through indian territory which is right now in pakistani control in, in gilgit baltistan area so so which other country has stood up to china this way so could you please uh, next question uh, sir could you please explain the threat posed by pla Uh, navy in indian ocean namely chinese port in pakistan and sri lanka um, okay so china china is uh, creating assets it is trying to uh, should i say draw a ring around our country sri lanka pakistan others around indian ocean why because the trade that passes through the indian ocean into the indo pacific 60% of their trade the energy needs are met from here or more than 60% i think and this is very it's an important artery that goes for them they are building up this port in uh, gwadar to have a warm water access to a warm water port as an alternate from gwadar along the uh, uh, road to karakoram Uh, highway the cpec corridor that i spoke about and then so that they have an alternate if this road if this route is blocked coming back to your question of indian ocean so they want to have a, a presence in indian ocean because they feel that their fleets will be vulnerable if not today then tomorrow they also want to assert themselves in indian ocean because indian ocean even by name shows how how uh, strategically india is located in this ocean incidentally you would be all it will be interesting for you all to know there is only one 
There is only one ocean in the world that is named after a country, and that is Indian Ocean. So their efforts are on to uh, their efforts are on to uh, somehow leverage their uh, presence to have a bigger and a better say in this in Indian Ocean. But then remember that this is in our backyard. And this is where we should be in a stronger position. Yeah, so do we have more time? Where do I go? Okay. Let me take uh, one more. I can take one more question. All right. Let me just see. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. So, okay. So the last question that I would take is. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have your name, but it says, and it's a very nice question, sir, as I'm representing you and women, my question is that uh, at what rate now we can see women participating in the army? Good question. <clears throat> women in the Indian army are doing, are a great asset. It's been only over two decades that women have started uh, uh, we've had women join the Indian Army other than uh, the medical do uh, doctors and nursing staff but the women officers in the Indian Army in fact I'd say Indian Armed Forces because Navy and Air Force also uh, have women officers women officers take part in fact let me just go to the selection process the selection process and their training there is very little if at, if at all any difference through their training rigors so we are very proud of women officers who participate in various activities yes uh, there are some limitations we do not have women officers in combat arms and we don't have uh, women officers in combat arms in several armies it is not only to do with the conditions because we have very active borders as we spoke about it both in Pakistan and China especially with LOC in Pakistan is far more active on a day-to-day -day basis on the other hand our societal conditions are such that women has to be given uh, as a gender has to be given her dignity when we live on bunkers in a post it is very difficult to uh, create uh, that dignity for a woman of any rank till we get there we have women are not taking part in combat arms uh, women are not uh, don't form part of combat arms infantry armored or mechanized columns but we have women as, as, as signalers, as engineers, they are very much in combat support arms and they're doing pretty well. They are there in all the logistic arms and they are a solid pillar. We recently had, albeit through the a court order, but we have now women are allowed to be in command of units. That means they will become commanding officers of their units. Earlier, the Indian Army was following, armed forces were following a policy. We were not allowing them to become commanding officers because uh, we, we thought they would retire at a, at a service bracket before they could become full colonels or commanding officers. But that has also changed. So while it will take a few years for them to graduate to that level, so the officer of today who will start competing with her male counterparts will become a commanding officer, but that will take a few years. But today, women are participative in everything except for that small part of uh, combat arms a couple of them also as a first we've started inducting women as soldiers we've raised uh, we've inducted some of them in the core of military police to see that as a pilot project and then based on our experiences with that this aspect is likely to be expanded I hope that answers your question. And I think uh, on that note, I think we should.
we should end it here now. Right. Thank you. So um, let me once again say it's been a pleasure and a delight to be able to address. And I uh, I see that there are people from all over. There are some who are joining in from, I think, overseas as well, uh, or some that present uh, the other side. Uh, thank you very much uh, for to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And uh, as I'm always fond of saying, let me end that. So when I see such a lot of young people in front of me, to all of you, a Josh Wala Jai Hind.